Hi, everyone. Thank you for um, taking this time um, to join us. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about mindful meditation for chronic pain. But before I get into that, just a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up on the East Coast in New York. Um, I did a dual degree program where I got my medical degree and my PhD at the same time. I did my PhD in neuroscience and I focused on studying how the brain is wired and how that wiring can change in response to stress and illness. Afterwards, I trained as an anesthesiologist. Um, I then moved here to Stanford to start my career as a physician in pain medicine. And I came here with my husband, Nathan, and my daughter, Emma, you can see their pictures here. And uh, I'm happy to say that we're completely sold on the West Coast and there's no looking back. All right, so in my talk, I'm going to discuss the what, why, and how of mindfulness meditation. So what is mindfulness and where did it come from? Why should I care about mindfulness? Does it really work? And how to practice mindfulness and apply it to chronic pain? So it seems like everywhere you go, you see or hear something about mindfulness. You read about it in the news, you hear about it at the doctor's office, and then as this time cover shows, it's part of a massive reaction to our stressed out multitasking culture. And it seems like we have a collective need to find some peace in this world. But what is mindfulness? I have read a lot of definitions and very long summaries about what it means, but I like simplicity. And I think the simplest way to explain what it means is to think of just three words, awareness, non-judgment, and the present. And putting these three words together, we have the non-judgmental awareness of the present moment. So we strive to be aware of each moment as it passes, whether it be good or bad. And we strive to be aware in a way that is free of criticism. And then a little bit about the origin of mindfulness meditation. So where did it come from? Well, the practice, practice of mindfulness traces its roots to Buddhism and Buddhist meditation. And it dates back to over 2,600 years ago. The Buddha was actually a historical figure named Siddhartha Gautama, who was considered a sage and a spiritual leader. I would like to share with you one parable that Siddhartha taught. It's called the parable of the two arrows. So Buddha, also known as Siddhartha, once asked the student, if a person is stuck by an arrow, is it painful? The student replied, it is. Siddhartha then asked, if the person is struck by a second arrow, is that even more painful? The student replied, it is. Siddhartha then explained, in life, we cannot always control the first arrow. However, the second arrow is our reaction to the first. And with that second arrow comes the possibility of choice. Now, I think this is quite remarkable because it shows that even 2,600 years ago, people had this notion that pain is complex and that pain can involve both the physical and the mental. So Siddhartha taught that although we can't control the first arrow, we can train our mind to control the second arrow or our response to pain. And now in our modern world, we have the research and the evidence to show that Siddhartha was actually right, which I'll talk about in a moment. So why mindfulness? We have evidence that mindfulness practice has both physical and mental benefits. Mentally, it can relieve stress, reduce anxiety, and improve mood. Uh, physically, it can boost energy, improve sleep, and reduce chronic pain. In terms of chronic pain, it can help with many pain conditions, including low back pain, fibromyalgia, headaches, chronic pelvic pain, and irritable bowel syndrome. Now, you might be thinking, gee, this sounds great. It sounds almost too good to be true. And how does it work? So here we have the science of mindfulness. 
um, in this one study, we see that a mindful personality is actually associated with lower pain sensitivity. So in this study, they um, had volunteers um, that were given questionnaires to determine how innately mindful they were. So how naturally um, mindful they are. And they administered two stimuli, um, both were heat. And the first one, the first heat stimuli was at 35 degrees Celsius for basically your body temperature. And the second stimuli was at 49 degrees Celsius. So basically hot enough to hurt, but not hot enough to cause any damage. And while they were delivering uh, these two stimuli, the patient's brains were imaged under MRI. And what they found was that um, if someone scored higher on mindfulness, if they were more innately mindful, they also had lower pain scores and they also had uh, less perception that the stimuli was unpleasant. Well, that's nice, you might say, um, but what if I'm not naturally mindful? Well, that's okay because mindful me mindfulness meditation is a type of mental training. So you can think of it like exercise for your brain. So as exercise can change your body, mindfulness can also change your brain. And this is what we call neuroplasticity. So here we have um, some fMRI scans. And I don't wanna make this too complicated, but basically um, you have three rows. And in the first row, you see patients or people that have kind of innately uh, mindful personality. They call it dispositional mindfulness here. And in the second row, we see people who've undergone training with um, brief mindfulness training. Um, so anywhere from four days to four weeks. And in the third group or the third row, we have um, people who have gone through extensive training. And in this case, these were expert Zen meditators. Um, and basically in the first row, um, they show that more mindful, pe uh, people who are more mindful um, personality wise um, were shown to have areas that were less active um, in terms of um, rumination and judging. So these, uh, these two areas, the PCC, also known as the posterior cingulate cortex and the precuneus, these two areas are associated with um, a lot of you know, thoughts and criticism and ruminations. So when someone is more mindful, they tend to have less activation in those areas. And then in, in the second row, um, we see that even brief mindfulness meditation, even as little as six hours, um, can really activate those areas that are responsible for controlling thoughts and emotions. So some of these areas um, are uh, the OFC or the orbital frontal cortex and the um, ACC or the anterior cingulate cortex. Um, so even a little bit of training and mindfulness can really activate those areas. Um, and, some, and along with that, it can also result in deactivation of the thalamus, which is an area that is associated with um, experiencing pain. Um, and then finally, in the, the last row here, we see with um, these expert Zen meditators, you actually see a decoupling of areas. And by decoupling, I mean that the area of the thalamus where you actually process pain, it, it can, you can actually see that that area is more disconnected from areas of the brain that um, perceive and attach emotions to the pain. So you might be wondering, um, can I get the same benefits just by relaxing? Why can't I just go take a vacation or go to the spa? Wouldn't that be just as good as you know, doing all this mindfulness? 
Well, it turns out that benefits um, are specific to the practice of mindfulness. And the way they know that is they done several studies where they compared mindfulness meditation to a placebo, placebo group or what they called sham mindfulness. So in that sham mindfulness group, they, there were no specific instructions. Um, so they would, they would just make generic statements like let's sit here and relax or let's sit here and meditate. And all of their factors between the two groups were the same. So it was the same instructor. They were sitting there for the same length of time, same place, et cetera. And they showed that compared to that sham group, people who um, participated in real mindfulness practice actually showed a greater reduction in pain scores. And they, there was also a second study that showed that compared um, a three-day mindfulness meditation retreat versus three days of relaxation. So maybe just going on vacation and relaxing. And in this study, it showed that with the, in the mindfulness group, there was a stronger con um, connectivity between um, two regions of the brain that um, support control the control of emotions. And amazingly, it also showed that mindfulness meditation can also influence your immune system. So they showed a reduction in IL-6, a marker that's associated with inflammation, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. So how to practice mindfulness? Well, just broadly speaking, mindfulness can be broken down into two categories of practice. There's an informal practice where you focus your full attention on whatever you happen to be doing and a formal practice, which involves setting aside time to actually do a practice. And the practice of mindfulness can also be viewed on a spectrum where you progress from one stage to the next. In the first stage, you practice focusing your attention on your breath. So it's a type of um, focused meditation. In the second stage, once you've kind of um, mastered focusing on your breathing, you can move on to this, this stage, which we call open monitoring. And here you expand your awareness beyond your breath to your surroundings. So it can be paying attention to your body sensations or the noises in the environment, like the birds chirping or the sirens whirring outside. And even beyond that, you can further expand your awareness beyond your environment. And finally, to this uh, last stage of com um, compassion. So that as you learn to accept the way things are in the moment, you'll gradually learn to accept yourself without judgment. And so the idea is that this plants the seed for self-compassion. And as you practice self-compassion, um, you may find that all, it'll also be easier to be compassionate towards the people around you. So, all right, you say, I'm convinced to start meditating. So you sit down, you close your eyes, you start to focus on your breath, and then what happens? Well, the first thing you'll probably notice when you sit quietly is just all these thoughts floating around your head, just a steady stream of thoughts. You might be thinking, I'm hungry, I'm sleepy, what do I have to do tomorrow? Or just sitting here just feels really weird. So you'll have all these thoughts and we call this the wandering mind. And the wandering mind is really the brain's natural resting state. So the brain is never quiet. And we know from modern neuro neuroscience that there's just this constant rich spectrum of electrical activity that is, is going on whether you're awake or whether you're sleeping. And the drawback of this is that, you know, it leads to lack of focus, absent-mindedness, rumination, difficult to focus on the task at hand. 
but there are benefits to this as well. It's, it's you know, it, it allows us to be creative. It gives us inspiration. You know, it, it gives us that kind of that eureka moment, it helps us solve problems and set goals. So when you first start to meditate, you might be tempted to try to suppress all these thoughts and to suppress this wandering mind. And you might be tempted just to tell your brain to be quiet. But really the practice is not so much about suppressing, it's about noticing and being aware of those thoughts. So here we have, is it mindful or mindful? So it's not really about um, suppressing this full mind, but kind of balancing it with the act of being mindful. So think of it um, as a balance and not, not as a struggle between the two states. And the more you become comfortable with this idea, the more you practice, over time you'll find that the balance will be tipped in favor of a clear mind. So this book um, was written by John Kabat-Zinn. He's a researcher and professor who's done a lot of work on mindfulness. He helped usher this mindfulness in, into the modern era, into the practice that we know, know it as now. And so he named this book um, Full Catastrophe Living. He toyed with the idea of calling it something else like paying attention and the healing power of mindfulness. But instead he kept coming back to this title. And, and that's because um, he wanted to convey that the pur purpose of mindfulness is not to suppress or avoid unpleasantness. In fact, it's to do the opposite. It's a practice that can allow you to face stress, pain and illness and to just face the full catastrophe of living. And we can do this by being aware present and non-judging. And so the hope is we can kind of reduce the effect of that second arrow that we talked about in, um, in the parable in the beginning. So in this slide, um, I just kind of want to go over the basic approach of practicing a, a mindfulness formally. Um, you can practice it in different positions here. It's, uh, I'll just go over a basic sitting practice. Um, so basically you find a comfortable position um, and you just start, start by sitting quietly. And then um, you, Bring your awareness to your breath and to your breathing, and you use that as an anchor because your breathing is something that's with you all the time and it's very rhythmic. And you'll, you know, it'll happen automatically. So it's really something that is um, something that is really good to um, center yourself with. And once you start to focus on the breathing, you'll start to notice that a steady stream of thoughts will emerge. So that's that wandering mind that we were just talking about. Um, and then the goal is, will not to be, the goal will be to not um, suppress those, those thoughts and to just bring your awareness um, back to your breathing. So whenever there's a thought, you just notice it, you notice it non-judgmentally, -judge and then you bring your attention back to your breath. And then you try to repeat this over and over again. And over time, you know, the, the hope is that you will gradually strengthen your ability to be mindful.
And one specific type of um, meditation that can be helpful for chronic pain specifically is the body scan. Um, this one, you kind of build upon the basic um, uh, breath meditation. So again, in, in this meditation, you'll start by tuning into your breath. And then you'll move on to um, feeling your belly um, move with the breath. And from there, you'll start to scan your body and you'll move from, you know, you could move from your head to your feet or from your feet to your head. But in whichever direction you're going, you'll basically be focusing on one body part at a time. And when you focus on each body part, You'll try to notice the sensations in that part and notice your thoughts. And when you notice them, you try to hold them in your mind's eye and then just let, let go of those thoughts and bring yourself back to, to the breathing, back to that body part. So you invite yourself to kind of simply inhabit your body and be in your body. And the next part of um, kind of the next uh, stage of the body scan would be to try to focus on that area that's causing you, you pain, um, that pain generator, so to speak. Um, and that can be very difficult for a lot of people. Um, so what, what you can do is um, as you focus on your pain, you can just try to, to observe the reaction you have to that, the pain. Notice the thoughts that are going on in your head. You know, some, some thoughts that you might, be you might be having are, this pain is killing me, this will never go away, I can't stand this. Um, so then what you do is you notice these thoughts and you just gently let them go. And if the pain becomes intense and unbearable, try to take a breath and take a break. And then again, go back to your breathing and try to summer, summon you know, inner, inner strength um, and willpower to kind of face the pain. And even if it's just for one breath, that's enough. And if you can try uh, to face your pain for even one breath, um, over time, you'll be able to endure for more and more breaths. And over time, your brain can actually rewire and the pain will gradually lessen and recede as we've, we've shown in some of the past slides um, with the MRI studies. So I'm going to guide you through a brief and basic sitting med meditation. I want you to find a comfortable position. You can be sitting or lying down or standing, whatever is comfortable for you. Now I want you to close your eyes. If you are not comfortable with that, just let your gaze fall and focus on the floor or on a wall. And then I want you to follow along with my instructions as best you can. And then afterwards, use the stretch of silence to practice on your own. All right, so I'm going to be using a chime to mark the beginning and the end of the meditation. So this chime isn't working, so we'll just start. All right. So as best you can, tune into your breathing, tune into your breath. Notice your belly moving with your breath. Feel your belly expand gently on the in-breath. Feel your belly recede on the out-breath. 
keep following the rhythm of your breathing, the air flowing into your body and then flowing out. Whenever your mind starts to wander, gently bring it back to your breath. When a thought appears, notice the thought and hold it in your mind's eye. Then gently and without judgment, let it go. Your mind might wander to sensations in your body, to feelings of discomfort or pain. Notice these sensations, sit with them and breathe with them, then gently let them go. Let go of judgment, let go of yesterday, let go of tomorrow. Bring your awareness to the now, to the present moment. If your mind wanders off a thousand times, you simply bring it back to your breath a thousand times. Intentionally cultivating an attitude of patience towards yourself. So now I'm gonna end the meditation. And so hopefully um, at home you didn't fall asleep and you're still with me. And I hope you know, uh, you're know you able to enjoy that a little bit. Um, or, and if you've never tried mindfulness before, um, you know, hopefully that gave you a little bit of a, a taste of what it's like. So um, now I wanna leave you with some recommendations for starting a practice. Um, first, it's highly recommended that you practice every day or at least as much as you can. Um, and it's also recommended that you set aside some time for formal practice. Um, the idea is that it will, this will give you the space and the time that is free from distractions. So you can think of this as a time for you, a time for you to care for yourself. And you can start by setting aside just five minutes a day. It doesn't have to be long. Um, you know, we're all busy, but choose a time that works for you. Um, it could be five minutes in the morning before the day starts and commit yourself to practicing for at least a few weeks so that over time you can find what works for you. And Hopefully, as you practice, um, as you practice formally, then you can start to incorporate this mindfulness more naturally into your daily life or through informal practice. Um, so you can start by just picking one daily activity. So it could be showering, it could be driving to work, it could be eating a meal, and um, you can try to do those, do that one activity mindfully. Um, and remember that through all your activities, whichever one that you pick, that your breathing is your anchor and that um, that's very invaluable because your breathing is available to you all the time. It's with you at every moment. So in summary, I would like you to think of mindfulness and pain psychology as empowering tools. So think of it as another tool in your toolbox. And think of these different tools as all working together with the same goal of providing hope, 
helping you heal so that ultimately you can live your life to the very fullest.